women wear a lot more cosmetics. They wear a lot more lotions and creams and skincares and products, which is ultimately increasing the toxic load. Hey guys, thank you so much for supporting us and watching our videos. If you'd like to support us some more and get some of our merchandise like this awesome apron, be sure to check out our website at thecarnivalrevolution.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the Carnival Revolution. Today my special guest is Josh Kreifels, and Josh and I are just going to have a conversation about the way we eat as Americans and as people in general lately, and why it's so important to make sure that you're eating more healthy and cutting out the toxins. So Josh, thank you so much for visiting with me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I am too. We've been trying to get together for a while, back and forth, back and forth. We kept having things that conflicted or one of us would forget to get back to the other one. And we're finally here. And it actually happened at a really great time because your father-in-law is experimenting with carnivore. So I definitely want to get to that. Um, but I want to talk about your story and what led you to be in the profession that you're in as a dietitian. Yeah. So I kind of went a roundabout way in school. I uh, wasn't completely sure what I want sports. Do I want to be around athletes, which would lead me to being wanting to go into physical therapy. A variety of reasons I switched on that and actually ended up really loving nutrition. Uh, I took a nutrition 101 class in college as part of my degree, loved it, fell in love with it, and then ultimately went on to pursue a master's degree in nutrition. Uh, focusing on the dietetic route. And so after my uh, graduate degree, I then went on to complete a supervised internship, um, which all dietitians have to complete 1200 hours of supervised practicum. So I moved to Texas, did uh, six months of internship through the University of Houston, and then ultimately moved back home to Seattle uh, and have been working uh, for myself, my own business ever since. But um, I grew up eating the standard American diet. I grew up on fast food. I grew up on microwavable food. I drank more Gatorade than I ca care to admit, more soda than I care to admit. And honestly, I never had any significant ramifications from those choices. Um, but when I actually started to eat real food, whole foods and start cooking for myself, I did notice an improvement in my skin. I noticed an improvement in my performance. I played college baseball. And so having that performance improvement was a big win. Um, I've been through the entire fitness um, space as a personal trainer and also doing it myself in contest prep and things like that. So I was able to see how nutrition plays a significant role in your outward appearance and also your performance. Well, then that led me down a cascade of, well, if this is if nutrition's doing this much, what else is it doing? And so that led me to really understand the quality of food, the sourcing of food. And then when I started to actually expand upon those things and remove a lot of the things found in the standard American diet, I just found that I just performed better. My brain fog was significantly improved. Um, and so I still would say I, I dabble in in a small amount recreational foods. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm 100% organic, 100% grass-fed. The things that I'm consuming I'm controlling what those ingredients are, but if I'm eating out, if I'm eating recreationally or at events or weddings or things like that, then I just choose with the best choices available there. But I would say 98% of my diet is very whole food focused. Yeah. And I think most people don't think about that. People think of food as I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. People don't think about food as being fuel for their body and that the quality of the food that they put in their body absolutely affects how they feel how they act, what they look like. People people seem to be completely unaware that when they are sick, autoimmune diseases, eczema, psoriasis, being overweight, people seem to really just not make that connection that I mean people people do kind of relate it to diet because everybody wants everybody's always on a diet. Um yeah. but it's always about weight loss, it's not about feeling good and getting healthy. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that I always wonder is how we can change that narrative. Do you think from people just wanting to watch what they eat to lose weight versus watching what they eat to be well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think even from a dietitian's perspective, there is a lot of information out there and it's hard to decipher truly what's good food and what's not. And there's a lot of differing opinions on what's good and what's not. I would say is if you can eat as close to food as found in nature as possible, like ultimately the long term is going to be a bigger win. A lot of times people don't see the food eaten today now short term as like really benefit for the long term. But my wife always talks about this analogy of being a 401k investment. 
the foods that you're eating now are a small deposit that you're probably going to see some benefit in the now, but ultimately 30, 40, 50 years down the road, when you've spent your lifetime eating really good quality nutrition, ultimately you're going to be significantly further along than the person who lived on the standard American diet for that time frame. Yeah. It's amazing because people will go on a diet, any kind of diet. Um, I like to talk about the ketogenic or the carnivore diet and what a difference that makes for people, but people will go on any kind of diet diets and they will lose weight and they will feel better. And then they will fall back to old patterns because that's what we do as humans, right? We just fall back to what we used to do, but especially with keto or carnivore diets, people blame the gaining the weight back and the getting sick again. They blame it on the diet they did to lose the weight and feel better. And they say, well, but I did ketogenic or I did carnivore and then I gained all my weight back. Well, you, it, that's not the diet's fault that you gained all your weight back. And it's the same way with things like Weight Watchers or counting calories or macros. If you go back to eating the way you were eating, you're going to go back to feeling the way you felt and looking the way you look. And people just really don't get that. They want to blame it on the diet that they did that got them better and then like take it away because they got sick again. Yeah. And, and you'll often hear even dietitians say diets don't work. Well, there is a lot of research to say that diets do work. The critical component to that is that diet sustainable for the average person. So in a carnivore or ketogenic space, that's probably going to move the needle forward significantly for a lot of people. Now, is the carnivore or keto approach beneficial for everybody? Probably not. Is it helpful for a lot of people? Yes. But then is that what does that look like for you the long term? Like we talked about my father-in-law, my mother-in-law is doing carnivore as well. Their long-term game was never to be on carnivore for the rest of their life. Their long-term goal was to use carnivore as an elimination diet to get them in a place of actually healing, decreasing the inflammation. And then we've talked about it, transition into more of a ketogenic diet. I do think that uh, aging individuals, I'm going to put a number on probably around 40 plus, probably should be aiming more towards a more metabolically flexible diet in that you're not consuming a bunch of unnecessary carbohydrates and you're utilizing fat as an energy source, you're getting high quality protein. Protein needs increase as we age. And so not only are you getting more protein as you age, you're not getting so much sugar, you're not getting so much carbohydrates, which is ultimately going to lead to potentially hyperinsulinemia, which is a driver in a lot of metabolic dysfunction. So for them, ketogenic, that's kind of the long-term play, but that's also something that we're gonna evaluate. Is it gonna be 100% of the time ketogenic? Probably not. But I would say when they're controlling their food, when they are going out, they're going to be thinking more in that mindset of ketogenic versus, oh, I'm just going to let loose uh, on this event and then have to get themselves back into ketosis. And on that point, on the, the ketogenic thing, now, I don't necessarily think everybody should be carnivore forever either, like somebody who is trying carnivore. I love carnivore as an elimination diet for people. Um, and I do think though that a, a ketogenic approach is where most people should end up. And by ketogenic approach, I mean uh, whole foods, clean foods, like a clean ketogenic diet, but keto gets a bad rap because of all the junk food, because of all the keto approved. Like who's approving that stuff? Like there's there's not some board out there, some committee being like, oh yeah, that's approved. That's a keto product. Yeah, you, you guys can eat that. You know, so, um, but I do think that a clean ketogenic approach, which is basically just whole foods, really. It's yep. whole foods, um, not very sugary fruits, but definitely some berries and things like that and some vegetables. I mean, I think that's where most people should end up, don't you? I totally agree. And again, as, as close as you can eat to nature, that's going to be a win. For most people, like eating a lower carbohydrate diet, it's going to be a win, especially for the aging population, getting those really good healthy fats. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of um, dark berries or even just eating produce that's in season. I don't think we need to completely eliminate vegetables. I think we can eliminate things that are probably causing more inflammation, especially for um, sensitive populations, but adding things in like blueberries. Blueberries are amazing, super high in antioxidants. And so even if you're not floating that line of truly being keto, but still incorporating honey, like local raw honey, um, blueberries, or even just like other fruits that are in season, I would see that as a big win. Yeah. And the cool thing about doing something like carnivore as an elimination diet is as you add things back in, you can see how they make you feel. So was one of the foods you were eating all the time causing you trouble and you just didn't know it. So for me, I had cut out coffee for about a year and a half. I had this weird taste and smell issue after a sickness that shall not be named. And um, it, it was like that for 
uh, two and a half years, I couldn't taste and smell many things. Many things tasted and smelled like skunk. It was horrible. And coffee was one of those things. And I added decaf back in recently and it made my thumbs hurt. It's like, I never would have known that coffee was causing me achy joints had I not cut it out and then added it back in. So a lot of people think that like the elimination diet is like cuckoo or weird or whatever, but it really can come in handy. If you do that, you cut those things out, even something like a lettuce or broccoli, like you could find, wow, that really does not agree with me, but you didn't know it before because you you were eating so much of it and you were eating so many things. You didn't know that those things bothered you. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times that can feel very restrictive for people is when they're like, oh, I can't eat this. I can't eat this. But when you do that elimination diet and you start to reintroduce those things back in, really what you're doing is you're creating a canvas of things that you can have. And so instead of focusing on things that you can't have, focus on the things that you can have, knowing that ultimately is going to make you feel really good. Your sleep is going to be better. You're going to have way more energy. You're going to be way more vital. No brain fog or limited brain fog. There's a lot of circumstances for that. But that canvas of like, hey, here's a list of 100 foods that I feel really good on. Great. Like execute that. Yes. So don't focus on the things you can't have on your elimination diet or your keto diet or whatever it is you choose. Instead, focus on, yeah, make a list, make a list of all the things you can have, because then you're going to be like, wow, that's a lot of foods. I'm really not being deprived at all. Um, and then I wanted to mention, cause you talked about like, you know, going off for a day because it's a holiday or whatever. And I did want to touch on that for a minute. Have you had experience? Um, because this was a light bulb moment for me when I found out about six months in about the difference between an abstainer and a moderator. No. No. So this is something that might come in handy for you. Um, an abstainer is somebody that has to abstain from all of those things or they binge on them. And a moderator is somebody who can have one Oreo. I've never eaten one Oreo. I am an abstainer through and through. The weekend that I became a carnivore, I ate 20 cupcakes in 36 hours. It was my birthday weekend. Thanks. I kid you not. I ate 20 cupcakes in 36 hours. And um, six months into carnivore, I found out about the difference between an abstainer and a moderator. And I was like, Oh my goodness, there is a reason. Like there's a reason I have you know something in me that makes me an abstainer. That's why I can't just have one. Like that is huge for people to have that eye-opening moment of wow, I'm an abstainer. Like because then you know that like I know that if I go off for the day or something or for a week because we're on vacation, it's going to be really really hard for me to get back on and it can't just it never has been for me just the one meal, just the one day or just the one week. And it, and it's not like, like, I know when I'm doing it, that I'm about to binge. I know yeah. when I'm doing it, that I am going to eat for this whole day. I'm going to shovel food in. Like I'm never going to eat again. Um, because that's the kind of effect it has on me. And then I, you know, I used to do that. And then I would punish myself. Like I would fast for five days or I would do a juice fast or, you know, I would do all these things to punish myself for the damage that I had, for the binging that I had done. Um, and so it's a huge thing for some people to realize that there is a difference between an abstainer and a moderator and it, moderation, all things in moderation doesn't work for everybody. Because yeah. if you tell me I can have um, like some nutritionists do, and we'll talk about this, but if you tell me I can have a rice crispy treat before I work out for the energy, I'm probably going to eat the whole box. <laughs> you know, like, well, if one is good, then the whole box must be better. I'm going to have all kinds of energy while I'm working out today. Like that's how it works for me in my head. Um, so I think that's good information to just kind of think about is the difference between an abstainer and a moderator. Can you take the day off or will it lead to a week or a month long binge for you? Yeah, that's a big thing. And I wouldn't say that I'm a a specialist by any means in the world of eating disorders. I, it's part of my own personal testimony. And I would say I've been both at different times of my life where there's been times where I'm like, Hey, I, I need to be an abstainer because if I eat something like it's going to open up a whole can of worms. Yeah. And then I would say now, like I'm in a position of life where I'm probably more in the camp of being a moderator where it's like, Hey, I can have a cupcake. Um, if I want to gluten-free, I can't have gluten, but there are times when I have things like that, but like Honestly, because I've gone so long just prioritizing whole foods and eating a really protein focused diet, like I genuinely am not motivated by sugar. And I know a lot of people can't say that. And in, in like, I get that there's different spectrums there. Some people have a sweet tooth. Some people are more savory. I am a savory guy. If you offer me a cake or a steak, I'm taking a steak 10 out of 10 times. Um, and so I just say that to say that I've been in both. And so I think the also component with that is just because you may feel like you may be a abstainer doesn't mean that that is always your identity but you also can make that your identity people that attach an identity to something are often more successful so people that attach hey i'm carnivore 
that becomes an identity. People that do I'm keto, that becomes an identity to where anything that contradicts that identity, you're more motivated to stay away from. So if someone's like, I'm, a, I'm, I follow a ketogenic diet. Great. They're more likely to abstain from those sugars, those rice crisp retreats and things like that, because it doesn't align with their identity, which ultimately is attached to their values. Yeah. And, and people don't know that there is no, um, signal sent to your brain when you're eating those kinds of of foods like the sugary foods, the ultra processed carbohydrates, there is there is nothing that sends to your brain that you're full and it's time to stop. But with yeah. something like steak or even some vegetables, but especially protein and fats, um, your body decides when you're full. But if you're filling yourself up with processed carbohydrates and things like that, that isn't that doesn't happen because like you'll get full with a steak. And then somebody will bring out dessert and you're so full you can't eat any more steak, but you see that dessert. And that yeah. light goes on. You want that dopamine hit from the from the cake. And you can find room for the cake, even though you couldn't eat any more of that steak. And so I think right. that's an important point too. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. So what do you tell people who come to you and talk about how their last dietitian said it was okay for them to have that Rice Krispie treat before they work out? Um, I don't think that you advocate for that, right? And so what do you tell people who think that it's okay to have the Pop-Tart or the Rice Krispie treat or those processed carbs before they work out when we all know that those foods aren't healthy? And there are there are registered dietitians out there recommending yeah. those foods. Correct. Um, just because all things are permissible doesn't mean all things are beneficial. Um, and so, and I admittedly have been through that camp myself, where if if it fits your macros, great, you can include uh, pop tarts post workout or whatnot. Um, from a performance perspective, you could make the argument that okay, th that's one thing. But being more in the functional medicine space, looking at more overall health, I just can't subscribe to any of those highly processed grains or sugars being a benefit for the long term in terms of metabolic health. We're seeing obesity rates approaching 50%, there'll be nearly 50% over the next decade. We're seeing cardiovascular disease continue to rise, diabetes continue to rise, Alzheimer's and dementia continue to rise. Men's testosterone is abysmal. And so all of these things are a factor related to the diet. And so if we're doing these things, because some dietitians say, Oh, yeah, you can eat this, you can eat that. It's very confusing, because the dietitian is meant to be the expert in the nutrition space. But if you have a dietitian saying, you can eat pudding and cereal when you get out of surgery in a hospital, but you can't have a steak and butter because it's going to give you a heart attack. Like that's a huge problem and a huge discrepancy. Yeah. And people also don't know that if you cut those things out of your diet, if you cut out the processed foods and you cut out the sugar, you suddenly don't want them anymore. Like you just said, you, you don't even really want those things, right? So if you cut those things out, you don't get that same reaction from seeing them as you would get now if you're kind of running on those things. Because that's the thing is your body is running on those sugars and carbohydrates. And if you stop giving those to your body, your body will adjust and your brain will follow along. And those things won't even look or sound good to you anymore. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, microbiome component to that too. Oftentimes the microbiome can be driving sugar cravings and things like that. But as you transition your diet to more whole foods or a heavier animal-based diet, your microbiome will adjust and you may not necessarily have those same signals from the gut to the brain, which is an endocrine organ in itself, um, saying, hey, we need sugar, we need sugar now. When you deprive those bad bacteria of the sugar of that fuel source, you'll get a, a, an adjustment of the ecosystem. And then ultimately you won't have those signals anymore. So let's talk about toxins for a minute. Toxins in our skincare products, toxins in even medications that we take, candles, air fresheners, laundry detergent, fabric softener, which people love that fabric softener. You see all the commercials, they smell it. it, smells so good, but it's actually the number one cause of indoor air pollution and people don't know that. And so let's talk about the toxins and how they affect people for a few minutes. Yeah, the three most important things to a human, food, water, and air. We can't live without either of these or any of these. Unfortunately, based on just the practices globally, all three of these areas are compromised. Um, the air that we breathe significantly toxic. You talked about like air fresheners and fabric softeners in the house. Honestly, the internal air is much more toxic than the external air, which is why we need to have really good air ventilation. Make sure your HVAC systems are cleaned out. Make sure you don't have mold in the house. 
But all of these toxins end up just being little exposures chronically on the body, which the body obviously has the liver, has kidneys that's meant to filter out these toxins. But when you have an overload, too much input of toxins, the output can't keep up. It's like a dam. Like you have all of this body of water that's going into one spot and the dam is controlling how much is being released. If you open up the dam, obviously you're going to get a lot of more like drainage. But if the dam is blocked or if it's not open completely, you're going to end up getting a backup of all of those toxins. And so toxins in the food, herbicides, pesticides, heavy metals, all the just different chemical agents and um, synthetic fertilizers and things like that, uh, or even processing chemicals or even things to make the shelf life extended are all chemicals that are not natural to the body. The water supply, tap water, a lot of toxins in the tap water, whether it's heavy metals, whether it's bacteria, whether it's parasites, and then the air. Obviously, there's a lot of toxins. So we are inundated with toxins. And I don't think people realize how much we are inundated until, again, you remove it. Same scenario as the food. For me, getting a lot of those toxins out of our home using more natural cleaning agents, using more natural laundry detergents, dishwashing soaps, now, when I walk through the grocery store and I go down the aisle that has all of like the Tide and all of that stuff, I get a headache because it's just so overwhelming because my senses are not used to that because I've removed so much of those toxins. Yeah, the same thing happens to me. And you and I talked about this before we started recording um, when we realized that we both use doTERRA essential oils for a lot of things at our house. And so I just wanted to touch on that. And if people have any other questions, um, because we're not going to talk about it a lot, but you can reach out to either one of us and we can help you um, with essential oil usage, how it works how to do it. Um, but we both use essential oils for medication, for cleaning, um, and basically just for detoxifying. So there are a lot of ways that you can get around, um, even taking some medications, like we don't use, um, Tylenol in our house or, um, ibuprofen. We don't use any of those things. As a matter of fact, anytime I do buy them, cause somebody has had, you know, their wisdom teeth removed, you know, something like that. I end up throwing the bottle away because it expires before we get to use it because we use essential oils for those things instead. Um, and so there are lots of ways you can, you rub them on for headaches, for muscle aches and pains and things like that. And you can also use them for cleaning, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a different tool um, to use. Um, it's certainly not the be all end all, but wherever there's something that like, think about if there is something that you're using your day to day, toothpaste. Okay. If you're using toothpaste, you're going to have to continue buying toothpaste. You might as well find a toothpaste that is a better alternative. If you're already using dishwasher detergent, you're going to have to continue buying that. You might as well start to phase in some of these products. This doesn't need to be something that is you just completely in one day overhaul your house. But every time you need to buy a new product, think, is there a way that I can get a healthier option to this? And obviously the, the sense and the air quality is important. And so yeah, use a lot, utilizing something like essential oils is great because you can have them diffusing. You can have them to different scents in different rooms. Like for us, we use the sleep blend in our bedroom. I get that going about an hour before. That way the environment is more calming and relaxing, which is ultimately going to have me sleeping better. Cleaning agents, they have uh, a variety of different cleaning agents. It's just utilizing natural compounds ultimately to de uh, clean, disinfect, work on bacteria, work on viruses, things like that. So it's just another tool uh, that we use. Yeah. And I don't eat plants, you know, cause I'm a, I'm a carnivore, so I don't eat plants, but I do think there's a, a place for plants for like cleaning and for medicine. And you mentioned the um, the diffuser, you know, people are right now all up in arms. So what about my scented candles? What about my plugins? This is a diffuser right here. I don't have it running right now, um, but it would diffuse. Um, it would just have a pretty little poof of um, what looks like smoke, but it's steam. It's cold steam coming out. And it just puts little particles of the essential oils in the air so that it smells good. You don't have to use a lot, but they can be used for things like that. You can use white vinegar for cleaning. It doesn't, oh, it doesn't have to be something special that you buy that's expensive. It doesn't even have to have oils in it. I do like to put some oils in mine so that you're smelling the oil when the white vinegar evaporates. But white vinegar is a great cleaning, cleaning tool. You can put it in a spray bottle and you can spray that everywhere and get rid of germs in your house. Um, and the other thing that I have found recently after using a sponge to clean bathtubs for a long time because I won't buy the toxic cleaners is those um, those steel, uh, what are they called? Scrubbers, the steel scrubbers. Mm -hmm. A lot yeah. of times they have soap in them, but if you get one without soap in it, man, the stuff in the bathtub just comes clean, like instantly. You don't even have to add anything to it. It just scrubs stuff right off. So there are a lot of different ways in your house that you can become toxin free and just start eliminating those toxins. I just recently started doing it with makeup um, and started buying a new brand of makeup, Araza it's called. Um, and so I'm not, I didn't, I didn't go spend $300 and buy all new makeup. I'm literally doing what you said. I am buying one thing at a time as I run out of what I usually use. 
um, placing an order and buying it from them instead of from Walmart. Is it a little bit more expensive? Yes. But I think it's totally worth it to not have those toxins in my body, on my skin and in my house. I just, I don't want the toxins to be around. Yeah, absolutely. And, and makeup is a big one. And I see this be a big issue for women. I work a lot with thyroid, um, hypothyroid and Hashimoto's. Um, and the data supports women being more prone to hypothyroid in Hashimoto's. Now, there's a, there's a lot of hypotheses. One of mine is, is makeup. Women wear a lot more cosmetics. They wear a lot more lotions and creams and skincares and products, which is ultimately increasing the toxic load, heavy metals um, or different things that, that are fragrances, endocrine disrupting. And so is makeup driving hypothyroid? No. Is it a contributing factor? I believe so. And so if you're using something that is continuing to add to that toxic load, and you switch that, you decrease the toxic load. Now your body can get back into a rhythm, back into a balance of how it's intended to be. Absolutely. Well, Josh, this was just a fabulous conversation. We'll have to do this again sometime and go more in depth about, you know, different kinds of nutrition approaches and things like that. But I think that we covered a lot of ground here. It gives people a lot of stuff to think about because the toxins in the food, I believe is what's driving Americans to be sick. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would love to do a follow up uh, and just kind of dive deeper in some different things. But um, those three things, food, water, air, if people just started thinking about those three things and how you can improve those things, perfection is never the goal. Perfection isn't attainable. But how can you on a daily basis improve those three areas, food, water and air? Amazing. Thank you so much, Josh. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time here on the Carnivore Revolution.